Good morning everyone. We continue with the uh, central nervous system. This is Dr. Shaima here. So uh, today I'll be doing uh, the last part of the motor tracts where we'll be dealing with upper motor neuron, lower motor neuron, uh, what are the features or the physiological basis of upper motor neuron uh, paralysis, low motor neuron paralysis and what the different features of different paralysis are. So just for you all to recollect, uh, the extent of upper motor neuron was from the brain, the forebrain uh, or from the brain stem, it continues till the spinal cord, that's the extent of the upper motor neuron and the lower motor neuron, the extent is from the anterior horncils of the spinal cord uh, to the muscles it innervate. So now what do you mean by the upper motor neuron paralysis? The paralysis that results from lesions of the descending fibers between the air origin and of, uh, between the air origin from the cortical motor areas and their termination on the anterior horn cells in the spinal cord is called as the upper motor neuron paralysis. Now clinically if you look at uh, the corticospinal tract lesions is referred as the upper motor neuron paralysis. So if you all get uh, a 10 marker as corticospinal tract you need to make a mention of what an upper motor neuron paralysis is and what are the features of the UMN paralysis. Uh, before we actually go deep into the UMN paralysis, I would just like to define what uh, the low motor neuron paralysis is. A low motor neuron paralysis is basically a disease which causes the destruction of the anterior horn cells of the spinal cord. There are axons which are present in the dorsal root, the nerve plexus or the peripheral nerves. Now you can see a lower motor neuron paralysis happening in polyomyelitis, motor neuron diseases and etc. There are many more. At least remember these two important ones. Now let's go to the features of the upper motor neuron paralysis. Uh, the features of upper motor neuron paralysis we sum up into nine points. The first one, there is increased muscle tone which we call as spasticity. Number two, muscle atrophy is present but uh, sorry uh, no muscle atrophy is present in uh, upper motor neuron paralysis but you can see that uh, there will be mild atrophy which occurs due to you know the long run which results from the disuse of the muscle which is called as the disuse atrophy. Number three muscles are usually affected in groups individual muscles are never affected in upper motor neuron paralysis. Number four, all the tendon reflexes are exaggerated. Five, the superficial reflexes are lost. Six, the extensor plantar response is present. Uh, you mean to tell that the Babinski sign is positive. There are no fascicular twitch twitches, no denervation potential in EMG and the nerve conduction studies will be normal with upper motor neuron paralysis. Now this is when you brief up the features of the upper motor neuron paralysis into nine points. Now we need to know in detail the physiological basis of some of the features of the upper motor neuron paralysis. So first to begin uh, we have uh, spasticity. You know that uh, there is increased uh, muscle tone or spasticity which is a significant, fe a significant feature of upper motor neuron paralysis. Now this spasticity uh, it occurs due to an increased discharge of the motor neurons and increased excitability of the motor neuron pool. In upper motor neuron lesion not only the cortical spinal fibers are cut or interrupted but also the cortico reticular fibers also gets damaged. So what happens is there is increased you know uh, naturally an increased motor neuron discharge and excitability. So you will find a general increase in the muscle tone that is basically you know the, uh, the, the base of uh, spasticity which is seen in upper motor neuron paralysis. Second is why you know it explains why there is uh, you know absence of muscle atrophy. Why does absence of muscle atrophy occur? You know that there is no muscle atrophy present in upper motor neuron paralysis but as you know uh, the time flies there may be mild atrophy which happens with the muscles which is 
or because of disuse or it's called as the disuse atrophy now this uh, muscle atrophy the absence of muscle atrophy occurs when the blood supply or the nerve supply to a muscle is disrupted in umn paralysis the nerve supply is normally not interrupted which uh, because the lower motor neurons are remaining intact in umn lesions therefore atrophy is not a feature of the umn paralysis however uh, the long standing cases you can see that there is disuse atrophy which is present number 3 is uh, you can see that the deep tendon reflexes are getting exaggerated uh, in the upper motor uh, usually the upper motor neurons are inhibitory to the low motor neurons this is a general thing you need to keep in mind so in upper motor neuron paralysis loss of these inhibitory influences normally increases the motor neuron discharge especially if you look uh, there is an increased gamma motor neuron discharge uh, which increases the sensitivity of the muscle spindle to stretch this basically results in increased deep tendon reflexes Uh, let's see the next point the loss of superficial reflexes the superficial reflexes are basically long polysynaptic reflexes uh, that involve different parts of the central nervous system for example uh, you know this is very different from the stretch reflex that are monosynaptic and integrated at the level of the spinal cord now the efferent pathways of these superficial reflexes it ascends up in the ascending pathways and the efferent pathways are present in the descending motor pathways that finally terminates on the skeletal muscle now in this lesions when the efferent pathways gets disrupted what happens is all the superficial reflexes gets abolished or it is lost so that's the reason why in the upper motor neuron paralysis or the lesions you can see the loss of superficial reflexes the last sixth point is the extensor plantar re response uh, the corticospinal tract basically excites the flexor motor neurons and it inhibits the extensor motor neurons which supplies the muscles of the digits of the limbs therefore when you normally stroke the sole of the foot it elicits the plantar flexion now when umn lesion or the umn paralysis happens there is disruption of the corticospinal influence on the lumbosacral motor neurons which causes a slightly different you know response from the normal one you can see there is dorsiflexion of the big toe and fanning of the other toes this is called the extensor plantar response or you tell it as the bevinsky sign is positive now we go to uh, so that's all with the upper motor neuron lesions the physiological basis of the features of the upper motor neuron now uh, we move on to uh, the lower motor neuron the extent of the lower motor neuron uh, we have already discussed it's from the anterior horns of the spinal cord to the uh, to the particular muscles which the lower motor neurons supply now the lower motor neuron paralysis occurs in diseases which basically causes a destruction of the anterior horn cells or even their axons which are present in the dorsal root it can be in the nerve plexus or the peripheral nerves now the examples of the low motor neuron disease are nerve lesions which occurs in a nerve injury or diseases of the nerves poliomyelitis motor neuron diseases or any kind of lesions of the nerve roots now if you look at the features of the lower motor neuron paralysis again similar to the upper motor neuron paralysis it is enlisted uh, or it's listed in nine points first you have uh, here you have flaccid paralysis where the muscles are hypotonic now if you are able to recollect you can see that the features of the umn lesion and the lmn lesion almost contrast there you had spastic paralysis here you have flaccid paralysis where the muscles remain hypotonic there was no muscle atrophy in umn lesion where here there is pronounced muscle atrophy number 3 individual muscles are affected depending on the muscles which are supplied by that particular nerve which is getting damaged 
where you can see in UMN lesion only group of muscles getting affected. The tendon reflexes are diminished or it is absent here in element lesions. Superficial reflexes are completely lost. Flexor plantar response is present. That means the Babinski sign is not elicited with the element paralysis. The Babinski sign is not positive here. Involuntary movements like fascicular twitches can be observed when, when there is a lesion with the lower motor neurons. The denervation potentials will be seen when you try to record the EMG. Denervation potential examples are, sorry, I go to the next one. Uh, the denervation potential examples are you have the fibrillation, fasciculation and some sharp waves which can be seen with the EMG recordings. Nerve conduction is decreased or in some cases the nerve conduction is completely absent. Now let's see what are the physiological basis of the uh, lower motor uh, neuron lesions. Now as the lower motor neurons uh, gets interrupted, you can see that the innervation to the muscle is lost. So that's the reason why there is very pronounced muscular atrophy which occurs as secretion of the nerve growth factors gets abolished and the muscle function is getting gradually lost. Now here in the lower motor neuron lesion, only the muscles that are innervated by the particular damaged nerve are affected. Not like in upper motor neuron lesions, you know a group of muscles or one whole limb or one side of the body is affected as you see in the UMN paralysis. Loss of motor neurons disrupts the reflex arc of the stretch reflex as well as you can see that the superficial reflex also gets lost. Now therefore both the tendon and the superficial reflexes are lost in the low motor neuron paralysis. The denervation, the, the nerve which is supplying the muscle is cut, that is why I am using the term denervation. Now this denervation basically abolish, abolishes the influences of gamma motor neurons that is finally resulting in hypotonia or, uh, the, or uh, uh, it results in flaccidity of the muscle which is a very important feature of the low motor neuron paralysis. Now usually muscular paralysis is, as, is associated with you know any kinds of sensory changes because the nerve that carries the motor impl impulses from the spinal cord also transmits you know the information to the spinal cord through the uh, ascending tracks. Nerve conduction you can see is getting decreased here because there is damage of the nerve fibers. You won't be able to elicit the Babinski sign due to the loss of uh, the activity in the motor neurons. But if at all if it is present, it is of the normal flexor type. Now as the muscle is denervated, you can see you know the denervation potential like you know fascicular twitches etc which, which will be present in the EMG recordings. Now here you can see a tabular column, so uh, you know where you know the differences between the upper motor neuron paralysis and the lower motor neuron paralysis is suggested and you have you know the 9 significant features of the both paralysis. This is basically uh, a very often asked 5 marker for you all, you need to be you know it should be at the tip of your tongue, you, sh it should, you should be very thorough with this. So you can see uh, the tabular column beautifully figures out the difference. You can see number one muscles affected, uh, UMN paralysis it is in group, element paralysis you can see individual muscles are not getting affected, uh, number two size of the muscles, UMN there is no atrophy, element there is you know atrophy which is a very pronounced feature of the lower motor neuron lesion. Number three types of paralysis, it is spastic paralysis in UMN lesion and it is flaccid paralysis in LMN lesion. UMN lesion you can see hypotonia of the muscle and LMN paralysis you can see hypotonia of the muscle. The tendon reflexes, all the tendon reflexes are exaggerated in UMN paralysis and uh, the tendon reflexes are either diminished or totally absent with the LMN paralysis. Superficial reflexes are absent in both the UMN paralysis and the LMN paralysis.
Babinski's uh, sign if you look at it is an extensor plantar response in UMN lesion and a flexor plantar response that means a negative Babinski's kind in lower motor neuron lesion. Involuntary uh, movements of the muscles you know any kind of twitches all those will be absent with the upper motor neuron lesion and it will be present with the element paralysis. EMG changes you would not see any denervation poten uh, potential, but you know you can see uh, fibrillation and lot of denervation potentials which will be seen in the EMG in case of the low motor neuron paralysis. The nerve conduction study you would not see any abnormalities with uh, you know if it is an upper motor neuron paralysis, but uh, there will be decreased nerve conduction in case of uh, the low motor neuron paralysis because the nerve which supplies the muscle is getting directly innervated and it is through the same nerve uh, the sensory impulses are traveling to the spinal cord. So, this is a very important tabular column and if the question comes as differentiate uh, the UMN paralysis and the element paralysis you need to exactly put it in the form of a tabular column which will help you all score really good marks. Now, uh, we go to the last part of today's class we have you know the patterns of paralysis where you know we will be discussing about the different types of paralysis or different categories of paralysis where you know we will talk about monoplegia, hemiplegia, paraplegia, quadriplegia and finally the isolated paralysis. Now, what do you mean by paralysis? Paralysis or you use the word plegia. Uh, which means that there is complete loss of involuntary movements uh, and you know uh, the term uh, paresis refers to the weakness of the muscle which you also call it as an incomplete paralysis. Now, depending upon the distribution of parts of the body involved you can categorize the, the paralysis to number one we call as monoplegia. Now, what do you mean by monoplegia? Monoplegia is basically referring to the weakness of weakness or paralysis of all the muscles of one limb. It can be a leg or an arm. Now, paralysis of an individual muscle or a group of muscle you never use the term monoplegia. Examples of monoplegia are you know you have the crural monoplegia by the term crural we refer to leg crural monoplegia which normally occurs due to any kind of trauma, myelitis, a disc prolapse uh, or a tumor of a thoracolumbar segment of the spinal cord or a brachial monoplegia, brachial which refers to an arm, a, a brachial monoplegia that normally occurs during you know any kind of disease which affects the cervical segments. Monoplegia can also sometimes occur due to you know any central cortical defect. Uh, it can be you know any kind of embolic infarction uh, many 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 types you can just keep that in mind. Uh, we go to the second category of paralysis which is uh, hemiplegia. Now, this hemiplegia means paralysis of one half of the body. Now, this is a commonest form of paralysis that basically involves either arm, leg and sometimes even the face on one side of the body. Usually it occurs due to you know any kind of lesion of the corticospinal pathway at the level of the internal capsule or at the capsular level which results in contralateral hemiplegia because you know that you know the 80 percent of the fibers after decusating through the internal capsule they cross over to the opposite side. So, that is why when there is a lesion is at the internal capsule you have the contralateral hemiplegia happening. We go to the third category of paralysis which is paraplegia. Now, this paraplegia basically refers to paralysis of both the lower limbs. Now, paraplegia is normally seen you know when there is an injury or when there is a spinal cord injury or any kind of disease which is basically transecting the spinal cord. Now, very rarely you know when there is a disease of a motor cortex or you know uh, the peripheral nerves or even corda equina when there is a disease very rarely you can see paraplegia happening. So, the most commonest cause of paraplegia is you know a complete transection of the spinal cord any kind of injury or a disease. Now, the fourth category of paralysis you have quadriplegia. Now, quadriplegia uh, you also use the term tetraplegia which is indicating that there is paralysis of all the four extremities of the body.
Now it usually occurs you know when there is a transection of the spinal cord which is happening at the upper cervical segments. Now any diseases of the upper motor neuron bilaterally in the cervical cord or cerebrum or even the brain stem can also cause quadriplegia or tetraplegia. You can see another category here which we refer to as diplegia. Now this diplegia is actually a very special form of quadriplegia, quadriplegia in which the legs are affected more than the arms. When you compare the legs and the arms in diplegia the legs will be affected more than the arms. Now the next small division of quadriplegia is a triplegia which occurs or which is, which is basically a transitional condition you know in the development or, or a partial recovery from tetraplegia happens triplegia. Now the last one uh, you have the isolated paralysis. Uh, now isolated paralysis is uh, or basically happens when one muscle group or you know more than one muscle group is affected due to you know any kind of disease of a particular nerve which is supplying the muscle or the particular branch of the nerve which is supplying the muscle that is when you know you can see that isolated group of muscles one or more group of muscles are getting uh, paralyzed uh, where we use the term isolated paralysis. So I think uh, that is uh, with the last uh, slide of today's class. So now with uh, today's class I actually wind up with you know everything about uh, the motor system, the motor tracks, the pathways, all the descending pathways we have finished discussing with you know uh, a highlight on the lower motor neurons. Uh, the lesions, the type, the paralysis, the different types of paralysis. So in uh, tomorrow's class, I will be doing basal ganglia which I think I will be doing in two classes. So before we actually go to basal ganglia, I would want you all to be really thorough with uh, you know uh, the sensory system which Dr. Mantha has taken and uh, the motor system and all the associated topics related to the motor system which I have done till now. So, you know, please do not keep uh, central nervous system portions pending for study. Make sure that you all are doing your daily portions immediately after every class. Please try to make your notes and be ready. Make sure that uh, you draw the tracks number of times because there are a number of tracks you all are studying both sensory and motor tracks uh, included. If you all are not really 100 percent thorough with the tracks, it is like mathematics anywhere as you draw the tracks you make a mistake you lose the whole marks you know there isn't anything like you know you draw the track till halfway through correct and you know then you make a mistake so the examiner gives you you know half of the marks no that never happens for tracks so please make sure that you are in and out thorough with you know while you draw the tracks you don't make any mistake you know from the way either the origin of the tract or the course of the tract or the termination of the tract and when it comes to you know the sensory tracks make sure make sure that you know you draw exactly the extent of the first order neurons second order neurons and the third order neurons where exactly they are cross they are crossing over are they decusating or the are the tracks remaining ipsilateral so please make a note of and and please make sure that you know when uh, uh, we have mentioned that the tract is decusating at the level of the spinal cord or at the level of the internal capsule you need to make it very clear in the figure also. So when it is mentioned that the track is decusating at the level of the spinal cord please make sure that you know you draw a straight line there. Moment you draw a line which is slanted down or it goes up you know your figure speaks that the tract is not decusating at the level of the spinal cord at the same level of the spinal cord where it enters the spinal cord. So please keep in mind all these small little things and very carefully do central nervous system because central nervous system and special senses together for in a 100 mark paper you get around 60 marks out of it. So if you are thorough in and out 100 percent thorough with central nervous system and special senses you are on a very safer side in passing the particular paper. So thank you guys for listening, meet you tomorrow in the next class, bye, study well.